My name is Komal, and I am a political science student at San Francisco State University. And I am aspiring to become an attorney. I am a first generation American, which means my, and my parents migrated here from the small island of Fiji in the 1980s. I am doing this podcast for an independent studies class about women and how laws have kept us oppressed and regulated to second class citizenship. My inspiration for this podcast came from my education in gendered politics and from my mom telling me her story about how she always wanted to become a nurse but could not accomplish her goals because her father told her to get married and have kids at a very young age. I come from a very traditional conservative Hindu family and finding my voice had to had been a challenge for me my entire life. So this is my voice my chance to say what I want to say in support of women everywhere. Today's podcast is about women in the private sector and how laws have kept them, well, all of us, from gaining complete equality in this country. The history of women in the private sector begins in between the 1930s and the mid-1970s, when women's participation in the economy continued to rise from stay-at-home moms to joining the workforce, with the gains primarily owing to an increase of work amongst married women. There was an emergence of working women in the around World War II when men were drafted into the war. However, in the 1950s, after the war was over, they were pushed back into becoming housewife, housewives when, when, when men started to come back and go back to work. This led to the civil rights movement of the 1950s, when women were allowed to go to law school and other and have other higher educations, as well as being able to join the workforce, such as becoming secretaries or other labor for labor forces, such as retail sales associates. Not exactly a job for someone who just went to law school. At the, in the 1950s, although women were able to go to law school, it was very challenging for women to become lawyers. It was impossible for women to become lawyers. In fact, a woman could have graduated the top of her class from Stanford University, yet she would still be put into the position of a secretary because she was a woman. Now, by the 1970s, during the second wave of feminism, 50% of single women and 40% of married women were participating in the labor force. By the early 1990s, the labor force participation rate of prime working age women were those from between the ages of 25 and 54, which this reached just over 74% compared to the roughly 93% of prime working aged men. By then, the share of women going into the traditional fields of teaching, nursing, social work, clerical work declined, and more women were becoming doctors, lawyers, managers, and professors. However, when it comes to executive women, women those who want to have high executive power, Women to this day are still it, are still oppressed when it comes to higher working positions. According to Forbes, 41, 41 out of the 500 Fortune 500 companies will be run by women in 2020 this year in 2021. In fact, when I was researching chairwomen of Fortune 500 companies in America for this podcast, for starters. Google tried to correct me and say chairman of the board. And the list of searches reverted back to female CEOs within Fortune 500s rather than chairwomen of boards of Fortune 500s. The word chairwoman is so uncommon that not even Google thinks that it is a word. However, when searching female chairwoman, chairman of the board, I finally found that in the Fortune 1000s, not the Fortune 500s. There were 37 boards, board chairs taken by women, while 929 company boards are run by men. 
So why is this happening? Why is it that from the 1950s all the way up till 2021, there are not enough executives that are female in this country? Well, some may say that because there's 929 companies that are currently run by men, that discrimination happens between between genders within the private sector. And while this is true, this is very true that discrimination does happen and men like to have what is known as the boys club within companies and within the private sector. However, the laws in this country still haven't matched up, has still, ha- still hasn't progressed enough to give women equal protection and equal rights within the private sectors. See, the Equal Protection Act of the 14th Amendment uses the levels of scrutiny test to determine whether a law discriminates on the basis of gender, race, religion, age, sex, sexual orientation, or national origin. There are three levels of scrutiny. Strict scrutiny, which is the highest level of scrutiny. And in order for the government to pass any type of discriminatory laws, the just the the government must have a compelling governmental interest, which justifies the means of the law. Second, you have intermediate scrutiny, which is in the middle. And in order to justify the means of the law for the government, the government must have a substantial governmental interest. And third, we have rational basis, which is the lowest level of scrutiny and the easiest level of scrutiny for the government to pass because they simply need a legitimate state interest. These tests determine whether the laws, the laws that the government passes discriminates against a specific group of people. And currently, gender falls under intermediate scrutiny. And this is why. In the case of Reed v. Reed, 1971, United States Supreme Court, the Idaho Probate Code specified that males must be preferred to females in appointing administrators of estates. After the death of their adopted son, both Sally and Cecil Reed sought to be named administrators of their son's estate. The Reeds were separated at the time, and so according to the Probate Code, Cecil was appointed administrator, which Sally then challenged in the court of law. This case went up to the United States Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled for the first time ever and under the 14th Amendment that the law discriminates against women, against women and is, under, is unconstitutional under the 14th Amendment. Now, this this caused the United States Supreme Court to look at the levels of scrutiny. However, during this time, strict strict scrutiny was the only level of scrutiny that the U.S. Supreme Court had reviewed. However, gi- instead of giving women strict scrutiny, which would give women the right to have the have the challenge of a compelling governmental interest for all laws that that, that justify the means of discrimination, the United States Supreme Court decided to add on rational basis. And this is what gave women a test of discrimination under the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Act. Because women did not, the United States Supreme Court decided that women did not need strict scrutiny, they created the lowest level of scrutiny, which is rational basis. Now, rational basis was then challenged in the U.S. Supreme Court during Craig v. Boren of 1976, five years after Reed v. Reed. In Craig v. Boren, an Oklahoma law prohibited the sales of non-intoxicating 3.2% beer to males under the age of 21, and to females under the age of 18. Curtis Craig, a male then then between the age of 18 and 21, and Carolyn Whitner, a licensed vendor, challenged the law as discriminatory. 
the court held that the law, the statute made unconstitutional gendered classifications. And instead of, again, looking at this case as strict scrutiny, the court looked at this case as a more heightened scrutiny, which then developed into intermediate scrutiny, which meant that the government needed a substantial governmental interest in order for gender-based discrimination laws to pass. So, women of this country, we have intermediate scrutiny. We have a higher level of scrutiny now under equal protection of the 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution because a man felt that he was discriminated against for not being able to buy alcohol. Our laws, our laws, our rights come from men not being able to buy alcohol in this country. Now, if we go further down the Supreme Court cases, you'll see the case of Onkel versus Sundowner Offshore Services. In this case, the court held that the Title Seven that Title Seven prohibits the same sex dis- sexual harassment. The case involves a man, a male offshore oil rig worker, subjected to sex-related humili- humiliating actions and physical assault in a sexual manner by two male co-workers and a supervisor. So, while, yes, men are constantly sexually harassed, in, even in the workforce, nobody is denying that men are not sexually harassed in the workforce. However, it took a man to get to the United States Supreme Court so that women can have rights to not be sexually harassed in the workplace. See, now you see this pattern. Now we see this pattern that it takes men being able to work, to being able to sue for women to be ha- to have rights in this country. Because a woman cannot just sue to have rights in this country. A man has to be the one to bring up these suits. Now, when you look at Mac Mining LLC versus the Equal Protection, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, this is the earliest case, the United States Supreme Court case. It was held in 2014. The court unanimously, unanimously held that Title VII authorizes the courts to conduct only limited reviews of Equal Employment Opportunity Commissions in effort to conciliate and settle discrimination charges before it can it can be filed as a lawsuit. The EEOC provides the employer with notice of the specific allegation and allows the employer to the opportunity to remedy allegedly discriminatory practices. So, for example. If a woman felt that she was discriminated against in this country, I mean, within a job, then the employer has the opportunity to allow her to hire her and fix their mistakes before she files a lawsuit in court. However, if you're looking at a boys club within the private sector, if you're looking at executive positions where there are more males than females, how is this law going to help women if women are not getting, if women aren't even seen as, or if women aren't even getting interviews in in these jobs? So what has Congress done to help women in this country? Well, Congress passed the Fair Labor Standards Act in 1938. Now, although it did not target women directly, the Fair Labor Standards Act has done much to help women earn a living wage. After President Roosevelt signed this, uh, the bill in 1938, the law said that the minimum wage, the minimum wage at 25 cents at that time, which has now risen to $7.25 an hour federally. The minimum wage affects more women than men in this country, particularly women who are single and head of the household. So laws that have been helped. So we we continue to see this pattern that laws that have helped women haven't even come directly of thinking about women. It's just it's 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 luck. 
luck has a lot to do with these laws helping women progress in this country. Now, in 1963, Congress passed the Equal Pay Act. The Equal Pay Act makes it explicitly illegal to pay women a lower wage than men simply based on sex. Though hardly a cure-all, the law offers a powerful tool for women to either file a claim against their employers or for unequal pay based on sex with equal employment opportunities with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission or go directly to the courts. However, to this day in 2020, in 2020, women only make 81 cents for every dollar a man makes. Now, this is hard for women to file complaints about, file lawsuits about, or go to the EEOC for, for help. Because if, if we are constantly told to not talk about how much money we are making within our jobs, how are women going to understand and know that they're not making as much money as their male counterparts? And so while there are these rules and these acts and these laws in place, there's still discrimination going on within the private sector that has suppressed women. And these laws are just not helping them. They're just not, they're not there for women to, to progress in this country. And to progress, most importantly, in the private sector and in executive positions. So we have Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Now, this is the most important law for protecting women. This is single-handedly the most important law for protecting women from workplace discrimination. And it came about by accident. As Congress was debating an anti-discrimination bill, the detractors of the bill proposed that an amendment adding sex as a category, believing that it would actually be a poison pill that would sink its chances of getting into of becoming a law. Instead, however, to their horror, it was adopted and passed into a law. So we continue to see this pattern that in order for women in this country to progress, in order for women to be executives, in order for women to do anything in this country, you have to rely on a man or you have to rely on an accident that will give women power or it would have to be gender as a whole. There's no laws in this country that has been directly targeting women to protect women of this country. And for that reason, only 37 out of the 1,000 Fortune 1,000 companies have female board members. And only 41 companies out of the 500 Fortune 500s in this country have female CEOs. Like I said before, it is harder a woman would